Welcome to our series, The Bible and Sexuality. In this series, we're gonna be studying God's plan for sexuality and more specifically, what the Bible says about homosexuality and same-sex marriage. Now, this is probably the most socially, politically, and relationally divisive subject. You know, many pastors refuse to teach on this subject because it's become a lightning rod to talk about homosexuality in our culture. So they just avoid it all together. But in the absence of pastors and leaders speaking on this subject, it has led to a lot of confusion. You know, Christians are wondering, is it a sin to be gay? Is homosexuality a sin that must be repented of? Or, given the right context, commitment, can we consider same-sex intimacy a blessing worth celebrating? You know, this is not an easy subject to talk about. You know, this topic is only easy for you if you don't have any gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender friends or family. This subject is only easy for you if you've never had a conversation with a son or a daughter who said those two words that changed everything when he or she said, I'm gay. This subject is only easy for you if you've never been invited to a gay or lesbian wedding. This subject is only easy for you if you don't live with same-sex attraction. You know, this is a very personal subject for me. I have a transgender family member one of my closest friends for over 20 years is bisexual. When I was a youth pastor, we had a student in our youth ministry that was like a daughter to me. I would get, you know, Father's Day cards from her. And one day she sat down with me and told me that she had been in a same-sex relationship for over a year. So this is not just another topic for me. This is about people. It's about my family, friends, and loved ones. And as I speak on this, I'm not just addressing an issue. I'm addressing men and women created in God's image. As I speak on this subject, there are two kinds of people listening. There are those inside the church who are wrestling with where they should stand on this subject. And there are those who are a part of the LGBTQ community who are wondering if this church is a safe place for them people who wonder if they will be accepted here or if they will only be seen as someone who is gay. People who wonder if they will be allowed to serve here or if the church thinks homosexuality is a special sin that prohibits them from actually being a part of the church community. If you are watching and you are a part of the LGBTQ community, I would like to apologize for the hate judgment, and condemnation that you've experienced from other Christians. I want to say that I'm sorry for the way you've been treated by the church and other Christians as a whole. I want to ask for your forgiveness for the things that have been said to you and done to you. I'm convinced that the same God who watched his own son beaten, mocked, humiliated, and ostracized is grieved over the pain and mistreatment of the LGBTQ community, especially those who are mistreated by other Christians. I wanna let you know that those people did not accurately represent God's heart towards you. John 13, 34, Jesus said, "'A new command I give you, "'Love one another as I have loved you, "'so you must love one another another. See, God told us to love one another just as he loved us. See, God's love for us is unconditional. God's love for us is not based on orientation, race, behavior, or performance. And it grieves the heart of God whenever someone withholds love from any person for any reason. There are Christians who show up at events with protest signs that say, God hates fags. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God loves everyone, and the kind of hatred they are showing is darker than anything that they are protesting against. Love is the orientation that every follower of Jesus is called to. We are called to be known for our love for all people. 
You know, Billy Graham said, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict, God's job to judge, and my job to love. See, our only job is to love, and part of loving people is speaking the truth. Ephesians 4.15 says that we are called to speak the truth in love. You know, in all the discussion about homosexuality, people usually lean towards one of two sides. You have the one group that says homosexuality is a sin and they are vocal against it because they believe they are speaking the truth on this subject, but they have no love for the LGBTQ community. Then on the other side is the group that loves the LGBT community, and and they're focused on extending grace to others, which is a very good thing, but they never speak the truth. They never actually say what God's word has to say. So one group pounds on truth without love, while the other group has love without truth. And what we need are people who will speak the truth in love. And we want to be a church that speaks the truth in love. To say what God's word has to say on this subject and to do it in a loving and honoring way. And that's what I hope to do in this series. As followers of Jesus, our source of truth is not found in public opinion. It's not found in our feelings or desires or what we want it to be. The truth source we always turn to is God's word. You know, at our church, we accept the Bible as the ultimate authority in our lives. We believe it should be embraced and woven into the fabric of every area of our lives. We don't conform the teachings of Jesus to our lifestyle. Rather, we conform our lives to the teachings of the Bible. And being a place that extends love and grace to all people and believes that the mistreatment of any person is unjust and wrong, God's church is also to be a place that must speak the truth of God's word, not in an arrogant way, but in a kind, loving way. So what does the Bible say about homosexuality and gay marriage? Genesis chapter one, verse 27 through 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. See, part of being made in the image of God is being made male and female. The differences between a man and a woman is part of being made in the image of God. Part of being made in God's image is our sexuality and the union between a man and a woman. Then it says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So the relationship that God blesses is between a man and a woman. Genesis chapter two goes on to say, the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. When God wanted to solve the problem of Adam's loneliness, he created a woman. And the way in which the woman was created indicates that she was designed to complement man. Like God didn't create Eve out of thin air. He took something from the man and created Eve. And what makes a woman unique is that she is like man, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, but that she is also different from man. She is a suitable helper, equal to man, but also his opposite. 
These two people become one flesh, referring to sexual intimacy, thus fulfilling God's command to be fruitful and multiply. Marriage is by definition the sort of union from which if everything is working properly, children can be conceived. Only two persons of the opposite sex can fulfill the procreative purpose of marriage. And this isn't just talking about Adam and Eve because Adam didn't have a father or mother to leave. God is saying, this is my design for all marriages for all time. This is bigger than just Adam and Eve. It's showing us God's design for marriage and sexual intimacy. It's not hard to conclude from a straightforward reading of Genesis that God's design for sexual intimacy is one man and one woman. The Bible teaches from the beginning, God designed full sexual expression to be between a man and a woman in the context of a marriage relationship. Any straight sexual activity outside of that ethic or any same-sex activity outside of that ethic is outside of God's plan. Hebrews 13.4 says this, Honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between wife and husband. God draws a firm line against casual and illicit sex. Now, while that is probably not what many LGBTQ community people want to hear, that is not what many straight people want to hear either. But from everything I've studied in the Bible, I can't find a single verse where God blesses any other sexual expression or relationship that is outside of the one man and one woman in the context of marriage. And no one, regardless of sexual orientation, is off the hook on this one. In Matthew 19, Jesus is asked about marriage and divorce, and Jesus answers their question by quoting from Genesis, restating God's original intention for man and woman. Matthew 19, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus reaffirms what God set up from the beginning. In the beginning, God made mankind male and female, husband and wife. Jesus clearly states, that marriage and sexuality is between a man and a woman in the context of marriage. Sexual intimacy is reserved for a man and woman inside the covenant of marriage. This is found all throughout the Bible. And any sexual expression outside of a monogamous marriage between husband and wife is sin. As seen in scripture, all forms of sex outside of marriage are unacceptable and homosexuality is one of those forms. You know, when God gives us a command or a boundary, it's always for our benefit. God is not some killjoy tyrant who doesn't want people to be happy. If God gives us a command, it's always for our benefit. It means following that command will ultimately lead to greater joy. So we have this box and inside this box is safety and let's say outside of this box is pain, heartache, and suffering. And let's say that my daughter Zion is playing inside this box and I say, Zion, don't leave this box. Am I being mean, intolerant, or judgmental by saying that? No, I'm actually being loving because I'm explaining the boundaries. Someone who doesn't care would say, just go wherever you want to go and do whatever you want to do, right? See, Jesus said that sex is reserved for a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage. So you could put that inside of the box. If you are single and sexually pure, you can put that inside the box. If you have a same-sex attraction, but you are not acting on that attraction, you could put that inside the box as well. 
Now this means that anything outside of this box is sin. Not just homosexuality, but any other sexual expression, whether it's lust, premarital sex, multiple sex partners, adultery, or pornography. Those are all outside of the parameters set up for marriage and sexuality. Any type of sexual expression outside of this box removes us from God's perfect will for our lives and brings pain and heartache into our lives. Because anytime God forbids something, it's not to hinder us or to keep us from enjoying life, it's always for our protection. Sex inside of marriage is a powerful thing that holds two people together. It says that the two become one flesh, but when that power of sex gets diverted outside of the covenant of marriage, it becomes destructive. The same power that it has to bring two people together is the same power that damages people. That's why the Bible from beginning to end has a lot to say about sex outside of God's original design. Whether it's lust, adultery, premarital sex, pornography, or homosexuality, God says it's sin because it's destructive and harmful. Now, it's important to understand that same-sex attraction is not sin. If you are attracted to the same sex, that is not a sin. In the same way, if I'm attracted sexually to a woman that isn't my wife. See, sin is what you do with that desire. If I see a beautiful woman walk by me, do I take a second look at her? Do I lust? Do I fantasize about being with her? Do I flirt with her? Do I have an affair with her? See, see, all of those actions would be considered sinful, but the fact that I'm sexually attracted to someone is not a sin. That is a temptation, and it's not a sin to be tempted. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all ways that we are, yet without sin. So it's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to have same-sex attraction. It's the practice of homosexuality that is a sin. You know, there are various passages that talk about same-sex relations, and we will look at those later on in this series, but I want to read one from a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And as I read this verse, I want you to think about how many times you find yourself on this list. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says this, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor those who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at that list carefully. Do you find yourself anywhere on that list? Do we have any wrongdoers watching? If you are watching and you've never done anything wrong, then please come by the church because if Jesus is watching, I would really love to meet him, right? Has anyone ever done anything sexually immoral? Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust, then you've committed adultery in your heart. Have you ever stolen anything? Well, then you're a thief. Well, what about greed? Right? You know, if you make more than $30,000 a year, you in the top 1% of the wealthiest people in the world, and yet the average American gives less than 3% of their income to charity, that's greed. Any slanderers, right? If you've ever been to a woman's Bible study, then that's you. Just kidding on that one. All right, do you find yourself anywhere on this list? I mean, I know I'm on this list. I'm not gonna tell you where I'm on this list, but I'm on this list. And I know that you are on this list as well because we're all on this list. None of us deserve to inherit the kingdom of God. While any sexual activity outside of a man and a woman in marriage is sin in God's eyes, I want you to know it is not the sin. Homosexuality is listed right in the middle of other sins. So there is no one who can approach this topic with a holier-than-thou attitude. 
My sin is on this list just like everyone else's, which means I need God's grace just as much as anyone else does. Before God, we are not gay, straight, transgender, bisexual. Before God, we are all sinful people in need of a savior. Before God, we are all broken people in need of healing. Before God, we are all messy people in need of cleansing. See, 1 Corinthians 6 would be a pretty depressing passage if it just ended right there by telling us that everyone on this list will not inherit the kingdom of God. But it doesn't stop there because God extends grace to every person on that list. God extends grace to all people, gay, straight, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, liars, murderers, slanderers, thieves, and alcoholics. So yes, the Bible teaches that any sexual activity outside of a man and woman in marriage is sin, but so is greed. So is idolatry and lust and lying, which is why we all need God's grace. Verse 11 goes on to say, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. The good news for every person is that God is still in the business of transforming the lives of broken people and doing for them what they could never do for themselves through the power of Jesus who washes and sanctifies us. See, there is a mindset that once someone has same-sex attraction that they're always gonna have same-sex attraction, that those feelings will never change. In fact, much of the reasoning behind the support of same-sex relationships is based on the idea that once someone has a same-sex attraction, that they will always be attracted to the same sex. But would you say, you know, once a thief, always a thief? Once an idol worshiper, always an idol worshiper? Once a prostitute, always a prostitute? Once greedy, always greedy? No, right? You would tell everyone that change is possible. And the same is true for homosexuality. Why do we think same-sex attraction is the one sin impossible to find freedom from, right? This verse shows us that it's possible to change, to find freedom. It says some of you were once like that, but not anymore because the power of God to transform lives is available to every single person regardless of the particular sin they struggle with. Change is possible. Now, there is no doubt that many people with same-sex desires, despite their best efforts, will experience these desires throughout their lives. But many have experienced profound transformation in this area. You know, I think of Rosaria Butterfield, the postmodern lesbian professor who became a Christian and Jesus transformed her life. Or Ron Sitlu, a husband, father, and pastor whose early life was marked by intense drug use and promiscuous same-sex behavior, or the poet Jackie Hill Perry, who had same-sex attraction as early as five years old and is now a wife and mother. Now, these drastic transformations don't happen for every single person, but they are possible. You know, others experience partial freedom. It's something they still have to resist for the rest of their lives. But one man said, I have to take up my cross every day. And my cross is the homosexual thoughts and desires that come into my mind. I don't act on them, but that doesn't mean that I don't have those thoughts. In the same way that some men will struggle with lustful thoughts for the rest of their lives, some people will battle homosexual thoughts for the rest of their lives, but they can still experience freedom by choosing to take up their cross. Some never experience transformation in their sexual orientation. 
They never have an attraction to the opposite sex, but their lives, their identity, behavior, thoughts, goals, attitudes, motives, and feelings are no longer dominated by their attraction. You know, one man said, uh, who struggled with same-sex attraction for his entire life said, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality, it's holiness. See, the goal for those leaving homosexuality is not heterosexuality or a 100% change in orientation, but the pursuit of wholeness and holiness in every area of their life. And while wholeness and holiness may lead some into a male-female marriage, there are others who will remain celibate. And those who choose to remain celibate and make a decision to live sexually pure lives, I hold them in the highest regard. Now, after hearing this, you might be thinking, are you saying that the church should open its doors to the LGBTQ community? That's the wrong question. The question is not, should we let them in the church? They are already here. Rather, the question should be, is this a safe place for people in that community to come and grow spiritually and allow God to work in their lives? See, God designed his church to be a place where we can all bring our brokenness and move beyond it together, which means the only orientation we are all called to have is love and to allow the Holy Spirit to work in the lives of people at his pace, not ours. So if you are a part of the LGBTQ community, I want you to know that our church is a safe place for you to come and grow and allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life. You know, I can't speak for every church, but I can speak for our church when I say, you are welcome at our church. Even if you don't agree with anything I've said up to this point, you are welcome. You don't have to believe what I believe to belong. Even if you disagree, you are welcome here. This is a safe place for you to come and grow. This is a place where you will be loved and accepted. This is a church where everyone is welcome.